Welcome everybody to our third What Online session today on house mods. I'll shortly hand over to Naz Erdem, who is our MC today, and he'll introduce all our fabulous panelists. I just want to let you know a couple of things about the webinar and how it works. If you look around your screen, you'll find a icon for Q&A. If you click on that, you can type uh, questions to the panel. Anything that comes up, we'd really like to hear your questions. That will help the flow of the, the session and let us know what exactly you're, you're interested in. There's also an option for people to be able to comment on questions. So if you have some experience and you'd like to answer that question in your, from your experience, you're welcome to do that too. So we'll hopefully get a quite a rich source of information this afternoon. There is also a chat function, another way that you can share information. I think that's all I'll say for now and I'll hand over to, to Naz to kick us off. Well, thanks, Shell. Um, hello, everyone. I thought we'd start off by just introducing ourselves, mentioning what level of injury we've got and how long we've had our injury. So, yeah, my name's Nas. I've got a C6 complete injury. Uh, late 91, I had my injury diving into shallow water. Uh, ben, do you want to go next? Yeah, so my name's Ben Gruder. I'm a T5 para. I've been in chair since 2012, and my injury was a result of a medical mishap. Thanks, Ben. Georgina? Hi, everyone. Um, I've sustained my spinal cord injury in November 2003 due to a blood clot at level T7. Thanks, Georgina. Lynn? Oh. Hi, I'm Lynn. Um, I have a T12 injury since 2006. Thanks, Lynn. Antonio? Hi, my name is Antonio. I'm a C67 quad. I had my injury early 2005. Uh, Peter VB? Hey, everybody. My name's Peter. Um, I had my injury in 1999. Um, from, had a motorbike accident, um, hit a tree, and resulting in C4 quadriplegia. Thanks, Peter. And Josh? A uh, C6, C7 incomplete, and I had my injury in a car crash back in 2005. Oh, thanks, Josh. So all of us guys have got a spinal cord injury, and the other two panellists, they're professionals that work at the hospital. So uh, just a quick introduction from Steve and what, what his role is there. Yeah, hi everyone. My name's Steve. I'm a building and access consultant. I work part-time at the Royal Talbot and have done for 10 years with the SKIS team. And um, I guess my role has been um, more in working with inpatient occupational therapists and then new patients at the Talbot in looking at home modifications and what the best solutions are for someone's home. Um, that's evolved over the years, and I do a lot of that sort of work privately now with NDIS participants. Uh, thanks, Steve. And Rachel? Hey everyone. My name's Rachel. I'm one of the inpatient occupational therapists here at the Talbot. So my role is around um, going out to people's houses and assessing what the environment looks like and making recommendations based on how your environment can better suit your function. Um, it's then about working with people, particularly if they are funded through a funding body like the NDIS or TAC around advocating for them completing those mods. Um, I guess as an inpatient OT, a lot of my role focuses on how can we best get your house ready so that when your rehab um, period has finished that you can go home. And then my colleagues in the community would look at the, some of those long-term mods around um, kitchen and um, workshops or things like that. One panellist who wasn't able to join us is Anthony Bartle, so I see his name pop up here and there as well. Uh, he couldn't join us. Uh, he's not feeling too well at the moment, but hey Anthony, thanks for sending us your photos and we'll talk to your pictures uh, anyway. So Sal's probably going to start by starting to the fantastic presentation with all of our photos and modifications in there. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to go from room to room, uh, as in, you know, from kitchen to lounge or bedroom, bathroom, and each person is going to have their own modification pictures on there and uh, going to get the panellists to talk about the picture that they sent through. So the first slide here, now th this is just a, a concept of a bathroom, I guess. I'll, does anyone want to talk about this? Uh, there's going to be an opportunity later as well, but just come to the planning, you know. So, uh, I can kick off a little. I can kick off a little bit, Nas. Given that um, it was actually my work, um, I guess with this one, this is actually from the home of an NDIS participant, where we were actually um, combining a, a separate toilet and a bathroom space to make one larger area. So the occupational therapist I was working with um, had already established the functional needs of the the NDIS participant and the homeowner. So we really just tailored. Um, access and door width and circulation space, um, preference for the, the participant's dominant arm, dominant side for using grab rails and the, the, the bathroom sort of came around um, from that concept uh, based on the functional needs of that particular person. So the next slide we'll uh, start with is uh, again you Steve so this is uh, access to premises two different two different versions I guess yeah look I guess so um, ramps are really a personal preference we find with people that need re re ramped access into the home um, it's probably the one area also where we try and stick to um, a disability standard the, the standard Australian standard AS 1428 in terms of gradients and falls to the ramps. But ideally and differently in these two photos, you can see that uh, one person's opted for more of a landscaping feature to the home. And the other person in this case has opted for a more traditional timber or merbu decked ramp. And both serve a purpose for two different people. And they're just two good examples of um, uh, where both homeowners were pretty heavily involved in, in what the finished outcome would look like and, and how it would work. Fantastic. And um, you, you can see from the um, two different access points, they, they look really, really well done. Uh, so if we move on to the next slide, which is, uh, again, uh, another version, isn't it, Steve, of uh, access to premises just another variation where again the, the homeowner or the, the yeah the person that's uh, returning home has elected not to go for traditional um, handrails they've just opted for from the street what looks to be like a typical veranda to a period home but there's actually some really clever access built into that veranda yeah a lot the platforms on both sides as well they're fantastic you know when you can put plants and um, use it as a seat you know outdoor area yeah lots of options for that design yeah and if i can uh, i might just add also that uh those ramps are really great uh, i'll keep it short but just when i was looking for my house when i was down in melbourne um you know it's a great thing to bring uh, the ramp because uh the house i purchased was about two and a half foot up off the ground the whole house so we put a ramp pretty much right around the house and then built a veranda like you can see on screen and um, that's where you consult the likes of Steve to make it look as seamless as possible. Yeah, that's great. This one is um, Peter Van Bentham. So I think he's going to talk about, um, you know, modifications don't have to stand out. You know, like uh, people looking at it wouldn't even know that the modification has been done. Yeah, it was important for me to um, find a ramp that wouldn't make the house look so... Um, with, so, look, I, didn't, I didn't want it to look so, sorry, so hospital or like I had a big ramp involved. So, um, you know, building the ramp up to the first step was important to me um, and to make it look aesthetically pleasing to blend in with the house, was, which I was really trying to say. Sorry about that. Um, also, the front door I've made uh, a little bit over a metre wide. And that was also so if I was ever needed to be picked up, in a stretcher from an ambulance that I could get through. 
that threshold there, that area. And that's all um, electronic and through an app on my chair that I can open up the front door. Pete, that's, I think, a great example of what is uh, becoming, you know, a very commonly used term these days in universal design. So it serves a purpose for um, wheelchair access, but it also makes life so easier and it just blends in with the current sort of environment. And it ticks so many boxes because it isn't the traditional um, ramp and rail system that would go into a home, yet it, 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 it retains the character and integrity of the home beautifully. Yeah, it's very important for us and I'm really happy the way it turned out. Also to give me total independence to enter by the front door just through an app because um, I can't open a front door. And I can also use my alarm button to engage the alarm and to turn on and off through an app on my phone. So I don't need to touch any buttons or take any keys with me. It's all done via an app on my phone. Just an example here, um, Naz and everybody, of how important it is to not only get the right um, clear opening or the width of a door that provides access from outside to inside, but to make sure that the thresholds give some consideration to the thresholds um, between those two abutting surfaces so that um, for someone that might be in a chair, they've got a nice um, sort of uh, even and consistent surface to travel over in multiple times in the day without having to negotiate uh, a threshold and where you can't avoid a threshold, not having to negotiate something like a, a rubber threshold ramp in addition to that. Mm. That's a situation where um, uh, I guess a more efficient or economical solution was sought. So the sliding door system was remaining in place. And I guess threshold ramps were put there to make life a lot easier for, for the user. Yeah, so the previous two or three slides were uh, built with thought beforehand, weren't they? And, and that last photo was something that was retrofitted to an existing sliding door, which turned out to be really good too. There's a couple of things going on in this particular design. And one of those is the, the grate system that's in the shower. So the fall of the shower, all the water flows through to the, the um, linear drainage grill. Now that is a more expensive way of um, providing drainage to a shower, but that's uh, seen as a, a really sort of acceptable solution for um, traveling from a wet area to a dry area. The other really interesting aspect about this, probably more so why I sent the slide, was the, the hinged glass door system. So when somebody is actually using the shower, they can actually close that door so it acts as a glass screen and keeps the other elements of the bathroom from getting wet. When it's not in use, it just simply folds back onto the wall and creates more circulation space in that, in that bathroom. So moving on to kitchens, so that was bathrooms. I don't think any questions have come through yet, so we'll continue looking at the various kitchens. Georgina, this is Georgina's kitchen. Do you want to talk to us about these two photos, Georgina? Yes, so the picture on the left shows the um, stove top with a space underneath so you can slide right under and um, cook your your meals. Um, one thing I should mention, some people may opt to um, lower that stovetop bench just so it's a lot easier to see over and above just, you know, really big saucepans. But um, another thing to note is the range hood is lowered as well so I can reach the on off buttons. Um, also, you'll see on the left there is the microwave, which um, we've, we've lowered so I can easily access. Um, it's not necessary. I've seen uh, microwaves on the benches, which are just as easy to use as well. But um, I like it down there. I don't have a picture of my oven, which is towards the right of the stove top, which is a slide and hide oven. Um, it's basically the door slides 
into the oven itself on the bottom, which gives you a lot of access to grab your food. And so you're not really bumping into any doors that's sticking out. Um, the right picture shows uh, lower benches um, on either side. Uh, that's easy for me to still roll on, under and um, make copies. And on the other side, it's lowered as well. I could cut my veggies there. Um, the sink is, uh, is higher, that's standard height, but I can still easily reach into and wash dishes there and the dishwasher to the left. So everything's um, in reach. So that's well, that's, I was going to ask Georgiana, do your oven, does the door open down or to the side? No, it opens down and then it slides under. Slides it into it. It slides into the oven itself at the, at the base. So you have a whole open oven space, if you like, with no doors you know, um, obscuring you. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. So he's a... Uh, uh, I think I think that's self-explanatory. Self it's just uh, showing that the kitchen bench is set at a height that I can easily roll under, and I can sit next to someone there if uh, that's what we want to do. Hmm. But you could also use it to like prepare. Like, I don't know if you cook or anything yeah. like that, but if yeah. you, so. It makes it easy for me to prepare food as well um, because I can get really close to the countertop. Oh, great. So um, this one is my kitchen and when I came to the kitchen um, there were cupboards underneath the island and there were cupboards underneath the sink so they've all been removed. You can notice that there's a difference in height between the um, island and the, the rest of the kitchen. So that part has been lowered and had the cupboards removed. It was really difficult to find someone to do it, um, but with Steve's help in writing up um, plans for it, it became much easier. The whole purpose of that space is to allow me to do a 360 between the bench and the sink or the bench and the, the oven, which is on the, the side uh, that I've taken the photo from. Um, you'll notice up on the kitchen bench, um, I use little, uh, yeah, the little buckets. So recycling and uh, stuff from a worm farm and then rubbish and the smaller bags are just easier to handle. Uh, like Georgina, I've got the, um, the dishwasher right next to the sink. And uh, it seems we all must have gone to the same uh, interior designer because I think our cuffs, all of our kitchens had the same colour and the same handles. <laughs> Just before we talk about this one, the dishwasher, Georgina and Lynn, is it like, uh, have you got a drawer type one or the door that comes down? Just access wise, I'm not sure which one would be easier for you guys. Um, I, the door just uh, opens and closes itself. Um, I mean, just like your typical dishwasher, but there are drawers inside. But having said that, my very first dishwasher was actually split into two drawers, like an upper and lower. So you just, um, if you don't have that many dishes, you can just run one. Um, but yes, I've tried both and both have been fine for me. Mm. So you adapt, don't you, to some situation? Yes. yes. Yeah. And, and you're the same, Lynn, with yours? Uh, only because it's been there since I've been there. When it's uh, had its last day, I'm going to look at one where as the drawer comes out, it lifts up. Mm. So so I don't have to bend down so much. Oh, good. This wasn't a slide to make people jealous, but it's where money is of no object. Mm. And the whole island um, has uh, a height adjustable function to it. So it can actually move up and down within a range of about 300 millimeters. Yeah. So that includes um, like flexible waste for all the um, water waste for the, the kitchen sink. 
and where there's going to be a uh, microwave oven or even a convection oven under the, the island itself or even a dishwasher, that would include flexible um, hosing. So that's an elaborate system. It's obviously something that uh, not everybody can afford, but it is, um, again, a solution that um, meets many needs for a, a family that could afford that and where there's, they've got like a family of, I think, three or four different children of different ages and it just gives the ultimate flexibility. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, get those kids doing the dishes as soon as possible. <laughs> so really, <laughs> good point, Lynn. I mean, it's just a photo that sort of indicates um, what technology is out there now to um, assist in get, giving people ideas. Um, a kitchen is built for, you know, as long as a bathroom, 20 years of life, hopefully, or more. So um, a lot of people now are thinking about what to invest in a kitchen to make it more accessible. And um, even for people that don't have disabilities, people that want to remain in their home for a long period of time and change from standing to, to being seated at, at times. Pretty cheap car performance expense paid uh, kitchen there today, Steve. I beg your pardon, Nose? Uh, cheap, cheap carpet for no expense uh, spared <laughs> kitchen. So no, we'll move on. Uh, just another example, similar to what Georgina and Lynn have incorporated. That's actually from, um, that's from a, an NDIS specialist disability accommodation uh, kitchen. The reason I've put that in is because um, where you've got different people using a kitchen potentially over the life of a kitchen, you might have different tenants renting a spot. That actually had cupboards in front of it that can be removed so that for one user that might be ambulant, that's fine to have cupboards and additional storage, but they've future-proofed that kitchen so that the cupboards can be pulled out so that someone with um, seated access needs can then access the kitchen sink as well. Nas, if I may, just before we go through the bathrooms, Does. Uh, there was actually a question I might direct towards Steve. It was regarding the ramps. Uh, Brian wrote in and asked, uh, are the ramps able to be customised, in particular the rubber ones? And uh, if that is so, where would he go for uh, suppliers to find such uh, ramps? Uh, I can answer that. The, the ramps are customisable. The guy comes out and measures up and cuts them, makes them to uh, order. Yeah. But I forget who it is. Steve, did you want to add any further to that? Uh, we're talking about the little rubber threshold ramps. Correct, yeah. I believe that's what the question was that Brian asked. Yeah, so I think um, depending on the supplier, I know that there's a range of suppliers and without um, naming particular ones, I think they're, they're pretty flexibly ordered. So some suppliers will have... Um, Threshold ramps in increments of five, ten millimeters, depending on what the threshold height is of, say, a brick sill outside. Um, whereas other suppliers will simply tailor um, the the ramps to suit what what the environment is. Um, hey, Steve, I found the Independent Living Centre having a lot of options on their website with all that type of stuff. Have you used that before? Yeah. yeah, now, Independent Living Centre, I'm not sure if they're actually around still in a face-to-face -face sort of contact now, are they? No, uh, on their website, it's got a lot okay. of choices. Yeah. Yeah. I can yeah, they, they've cut back from some of the, the um, showroom that they used to have. What you've got to remember, too, is with the threshold ramps, they really are designed to go only to a certain height. So once you go to a certain height, I think it's 190 millimetres, you really need to start looking at a, a proper landing and ramp setup. Yeah. So uh, Rachel, Rachel's got a, a, a answered that question also. Rachel, do you want to add any more to possible suppliers of the uh, rubber ramp? Yeah, I was a bit naughty and named some suppliers. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not, I'm not getting paid for it, don't worry. Um, Adacare or even Bunnings um, sell the threshold ramps that are prefabricated. So the yeah. brand is called Raven. And then companies like Enviro Rubber can come out and, and measure up the area and customize the ramps there. But I guess Steve mentions a really good point. Um, 
if you are going to organise that, it might be good to get an OT to come out and have a look as well to see what the gradient of the threshold would best suit your level of function. Fantastic. And, um, and I think, Antonio, you had something you wanted to add on the kitchen front? Yeah, just on the... Um like with all the benches and all that, that's great. But the biggest thing that helped me functionally with the kitchen, and um, I guess Rachel could talk about the OT perspective point of this, is the things like with my I have limited hand function, actually things like the utensils, like the knives and all that. Um, that was probably the biggest thing. Like the bench heights and stovetops never really affected me. Um, but the biggest consideration that made my think kitchen uh, more functional was the adaptive equipment within the kitchen itself. Um, and that really gave me the independence to cook more so than the heights and um, what have you. So I think that's a really important consideration as well for people with limited hand function. That's a great one, Antonio. And certainly if you're an inpatient here at the Talbot, um, we do have quite a few um, different options that people can come and try. So for those who are inpatients, have a chat to your OT. Um, and definitely for people living in the community already, um, have a chat to your community OT about what's available and, and what sort of things you find challenging. Yeah, and there's a lot of options uh, when it comes to knives and just kitchen gadgets, like even can openers and things like that. Um, that was probably the biggest one for me that gave me independence in the kitchen because I do like to cook. Um, so for me, like I said, it wasn't so much the bench heights personally, um, but just the ability to have access to the utensils, so. Right, and uh, also Steve, you answered a question from Colin who was asking about the mechanism to allow the cupboard up to ramp up and down and. Oh, it did. Yep, so in the background on that, on the top of the bench top actually, there's the box. Oh, okay. So it's um, Linac is the company. Um, I believe uh, either Hayfley or Lincoln Century might be the providers for that type of mechanism. All right, and we'll move on. Bathroom. So I think we've got a few different um, versions of modifications for that panel set. Uh, this is Georgina's bathroom. So do you want to talk to us about the modifications you've got there? Yes, nurse. This is uh, pretty much the only thing that um, you can see here is that we've got access underneath the sink and the sink is quite large. As, as it can see, it extends out. So there's less chance of water spillage. Sorry, guys, there's some background noise coming from somewhere. I think it's gone. So I continue, Georgiana? Yes, so, yeah, so again, there's space underneath and the large sink, and um, the drawers are just there for easy access to your usual um, things that you need. So that's pretty much simple adaptation there. Yeah, that, that's my bathroom, and uh, it just shows the access under the sink. It's a pretty similar theme, isn't it? You know, I mean, underneath the sink, there's no drawers and the sink actually comes out further than the bench or the platform where you keep your, um, you know, Nick's um, toothbrush and all that other stuff. Yeah, and those, can I just add, um, I have a very similar setup in my bathroom, but the two cabinets on the side, I left freestanding and put them on wheels you don't notice that they are on wheels, but I can wheel them out um, because they're full of my stuff that if I need to wheel it to my bedroom or just wheel it out to clean, or one day if I want to change them over, I can just get a cabinet maker to build those boxes and put wheels underneath any style I like, um, just matching the height. Um, so that's they're not fixed in on my bathroom. Yeah. Okay, that's a good idea. Yeah, I haven't seen that before, but it sounds like um, it will work well. Can I just add something back on that photo, Naz? Um, those two photos are really good and they demonstrate why there's no one solution for everybody. Georgina's is really good, I think, because it highlights the fact that um, everybody's got the same need of getting access under the sink, but not having the basin or bench top too high 
so that when you put your mirror behind it, it's very difficult to see yourself in your mirror. Quite the opposite of that is Ben, but Ben's potentially using different equipment in his bathroom. So his mirror is actually a little bit higher. But both people, I think, have thought about where they want to have um, those different components of the bathroom. Yeah. And it looks like, Ben, um, your mirror behind that, is that a cabinet? So you've got storage behind it. Yeah, um, we'll, we'll get to that in a couple of slides, I think. Okay. And I'm conscious that, Steve, you might need to leave us shortly. Um, oh, look, I'll, I'll stick around, so I'll, I can stick around for another 10 or 15 minutes. <laughs> oh, great. All right. I was just uh, mentioning that Colin had asked about the, the up-down bench top again. I was wondering if it was a scissor lift, but you can maybe type an answer to that one. Oh, uh, okay. Okay, th this is my bathroom. Um, I just want to point out, you can get shower sets where... Uh, you can set the temperature. I th the first time I came home from the Talbot, I burnt myself. Um, I put the shower rose in my lap and someone else in the house turned on a cold, cold tap and I got seriously burnt. Uh, with this sort of system, um, you can just set the temperature and don't have to worry about it. Oh, that's excellent. And you got two outlets on that? Yeah, yeah so uh, as you can see, there's uh, that outlet on the and up the top. Yeah. So it wants to keep your legs warm and wants to. Yeah, you can. You can uh, well, you can you can luxuriate under something like that. So. Yeah, luxury. So that, yeah, that's oh, that's my ensuite. Yeah. And you can so see the chat. Yeah. The other one was the main bathroom. Mm. So again, this is your other bathroom with the same. Yeah, same this this is the bathroom I use every morning. So, so temperature is just set, and I don't have to worry about what other people in the house are doing. Yeah, I think that's really important, you know, especially uh, as we all know, uh, we we lose feeling, and we can't tell hot and cold in our legs or our our trunks, and it's good to if you're not sure about that. You don't want to end up in hospital with burns. Nas, we had a question coming from one of our mentors. Uh, ben, we're just wondering, uh, was your window, oh, was your window, was your mirror uh, on an angle? No, the, no. Uh, the mirror might look a little bit peculiar because it's recessed into the, uh, into the wall. Uh, yeah. It's not an angle. It's probably the way the photo's been taken. Yeah, it, it, to me, it did look like it was angled as well. But I guess to that point, Rachel, do you often curb some of the mirrors so there's an angle so it's easier for people to see? I haven't personally recommended it before, but if certainly if it made um, vision easier, then that would definitely be something we could consider. Yeah. And so this is Georgina's bathroom. Can you talk to us about um, what you've got in your bathroom, Georgina? Yes, I can. Um, so this bathroom, the width is actually um, the edge of that photograph. So just after those little tiles, that's the edge of the, um, the shower. So my wheelchair can actually fit in that space from the bench to the wall, um, which is not visible. So I have a padded shower seat that folds um, from the wall, but it's permanently down because I'm the only one that uses the shower. Um, it also has the handrail for stability and for me to help me transfer onto the bench. And you've got the shower hose and um, little shelves to put my shampoo and um, other stuff there. And I can easily, after I've transferred onto the bench, I can easily um, roll the wheelchair around the curtain so it's in front of the towel and I can easily just um, slide the curtain forward um, and yeah so the towels they're easy access after the shower and yeah and the the tiles on the on the ground they're sort of um, uh, have been put so that uh, all the water drains um, and it doesn't flow to the rest of the bathroom 
So to the right, um, I elected to have, because of the size of the bathroom, I had the luxury of putting a change bench table. This is where I roll from the shower to this bed, which is on the other side of the wall. Um, and I transfer there to get changed. I would have all my clothes ready. I've got all my shoes there, so I uh, don't have to worry about not forgetting my shoes. Um, so, yeah, so that's where I get changed. And also that's padded, and it also has got a little sheepskin underneath the towel. Um, so, yeah, pretty much I dry myself mostly in the shower, but I finish off my feet and all that sort of thing at the end whilst I'm on this change bench table. I might just um, add a comment, Georgina. It's a good example of where someone's chosen not to put like a, a safety vinyl flooring in their bathroom or ensuite. And five years ago, only five years ago, it was very hard to find floor tiles that had the appropriate non-slip ratings available. These days, like technology in the kitchen, um, places like Beaumont Tiles, Rachel, we're mentioning um, outlets now, um, have really good um, resources and um, examples of tiles that would need to go in that application. And there's a great range of floor tiles on the market now, which serve the same purpose as a safety vinyl. I can just add to that, Steve. These tiles are actually um, more so outdoor tiles. They're not smooth yep. and they've got a bit porous. So it helps with the grip. So I haven't had an issue um, with slipping with my wheelchair and um, it, you can see the slide board on my change bench table so I do use a slide board to, to transfer onto that but I do use a handrail for the shower because I can use that instead of using a slide board. That's a, that's a good point to bring up about the non-slip flooring because I use carers um, to shower me and it was a requirement for to have a non-slip flooring, um, not so much for me, but for my carers because, of course, they're handling me throughout a shower. But, um, yeah, I found a non-slip tile, which uh, fitted in and uh, worked out. But, you know, those guys that will use carers, you've got to protect them too in those sort of areas. And we, oh, we had a question from Duke about the rating number or spec. Yeah, so I just answered that, um, right. Stella. I'll explain it though. If you're looking for a floor tile that's going to go into a situation uh, like Georgina's or an accessible bathroom, then you need to look at the non-slip or the wet pendulum rating of P3. And that would be the minimum accepted slip resistance for a floor tile. And something like, that's equivalent to like the ultra safety flooring vinyl that you put in um, a bathroom where you're not putting floor tiles. So this is um, my toilet on the left. Again, it's got a padded toilet seat for those that actually need to protect their, um, their bony prominences, I guess. And um, on, you can see that handrail there, which helps me transfer. And to the right, I've got a little um, rack where I can put all my things that I need to do my morning routine and I can also hang my night bag there to dry off and that's just a good place for me to put my pickup stick so I know where it is all the time <laughs> and um, yeah so that's the toilet which is also in that same room with the shower and the change bench table. Well, can I know George and I you've actually uh, lifted the hot of it so it's very important you know you don't want to be transferring up or down so you put a bit of a, a platform or the toilet onto a bit of a platform so it's a perfect height for you. Yes, that's right, Naz. That was a bit of a, a building error um, or, yeah, so something happened along the building stage. So you've got to oh. make sure you get the right toilet height uh, when you purchase and otherwise you've got um, a, a solution just like this if there is ever an issue. Oh. Uh, that, that's my bathroom, my ensuite. Um, what I want to highlight there was that the cistern is uh, recessed in the wall, which makes the whole unit a little bit smaller 
which gives me more space to move around a fairly small room. And uh, good and you, well. can, you can see that that's also my bathroom. You can see the same sort of idea here. The cupboard has been recessed into the wall. You gain, I think it's 40 millimetres or so, but that makes quite a difference if you're working in a small space. Yeah. I reckon you're an engineer, Ben. Uh, no, I just had a clever uh, mod mod uh, bathroom modifiers. <laughs> now this one, this is really interesting. This is Antonio's bathroom. So the two last bathrooms we saw, they were quite, quite large and spacious. So what Antonio's done is he's actually modified the, the bathroom that he had and be used uh, without a lot of space. So, uh, Antonio, do you want to just speak to us about these uh, photos? Yeah, so when I left rehab, I had the full accessible setup, uh, a lot like Ben and Georgina have shown. Um, when I moved out of there, sort of, we found somewhere, my partner and I, um, and sort of we found here and I guess to me it was like, okay, we weren't sure how long we were going to stay here. So we didn't want to do be really big modifications. And I thought, well, look, we take the door off the shower. Uh, there was a slight step. So I was transferring in um, with my chair at an angle, but I thought, you know, I, I can get my, make myself a little platform out of some foam. Um, and then, you know, transfer in and out onto a shower. Like I use a plastic shower chair anyway. Um, so I was able to transfer in and out there pretty safely. And I use a regular toilet. So, you know, when you don't want to do big modifications, um, like I, I had it offered by OTs and all that when we moved here to potentially get modifications, but not being sure how long we're going to be here. I didn't really want to go through that whole process. Um, so I just made use of what I had um, and it works for me. You know, it, it's safe um, and, it, you know, it does everything that I need it to do. Um, you know, the, there is a bath here as well that I'm able to transfer in and out of. So for me, the biggest thing was, yeah, look, although it's not, I guess, as fully accessible as Georgina's and Ben's, it, it actually works for me. Um, and, and you know, at the moment, it's fine for me. So, well, no, that's fantastic. I was going to say, I think it also shows the the way that you can change a setup when you uh, you go to a hotel that's meant to be totally accessible and is not, or maybe stay at a friend's place overnight, and that with with a bit of lateral thinking, you can come up with a way to to use most things. Yeah, and that's a really really good point there. Like you talk about hotels, then like as I've travelled a lot, I guess playing sport with Nas and Josh, and you sort of learn to get in and out of hotel bathrooms, um, which can be pretty tight. Um, so with that knowledge, I then obviously figured, well, we needed somewhere to live. Um, and I just adapted what we have, and um, you know, I guess for someone in rehab. If it's the difference between staying in rehab and then coming home just by thinking laterally just to get home while you're in the interim um, and your transfers are good enough, I think that like just adapting to what you got, but like I said, if it means you can get home, um, but it's just an example of where you don't have a lot of space, um, and you don't have a fully accessible bathroom, um, sort of, you know, what you can do. Yeah, just yeah. Beware, beware of sometimes with these plastic type um, chairs. Uh, this one's really good. It's got metal legs. But yeah. I've heard of people using um, garden chairs just for temporary type situations or which um, sometimes go longer than temporary. And when you put those garden chairs through heat cycles from a shower, hot and cold, they uh, end up breaking or the legs just go brittle and spread out. So be careful of that one. Did they yeah. not happen to you, Vecchio? I was just going to say, I, I, I think you and I were uh, playing rugby somewhere and uh, <laughs> the uh, garden chair leg snapped um, with me on it, um, which wasn't much fun. Uh, if you are going to use a garden chair, use two chairs that come on top of each other.
um, so it makes it stronger. But, um, you know, if you're going to use it at home, like these are easily available through, you know, Ada Care. You know, that's pretty sure, pretty sure yeah. I got mine off. Um, but always get, yeah, the metal legs, um, which is really important. And that's height adjustable as well. Um, yeah, so you can change the height to make the transfer easier for yourself as well. So, yeah. No, that's great. Okay, so we've got a few more slides to go off bathroom. We'll try to rush through, not rush, but we'll try to make sure we get uh, through as much as we can. Um, this is Josh Ho's bathroom, and you can see his, his bench is a little bit different. So, yeah, Naz, this is just the Bunnings job, and um, so got the chair from there. Um, I was fortunate that, um, I guess, my grandparents purchased this house, and um, my dad's a bit of a handyman, so... We made this into a very much an open shower. And uh, maybe if you go to the next slide, so. Um, and then, yeah, so we had all the original, I guess, toilet and everything else situated. But I think it was important to note now, as if I can quickly, uh, we moved that wall. So in the adjacent uh, bedroom, uh, adjacent room rather, uh, it's a laundry. And we also put a bathroom or a toilet in that uh, room. And uh, I guess it's important for those that may be cohabitating or, you know, have partners. It might be an option also to have two toilets because sometimes, you know, we like to take our time and uh, go through our routines. And um, I found that very valuable because when I moved into it, I was, uh, I had to cohabitate, to obviously pay for rent with two other individuals. <laughs> no, definitely. Uh, yeah, we, we don't have to say, but we use a bathroom for a long time. And if someone's yeah. got yeah. a back. Yeah, I was just going to say on that, like when my partner and I were looking for somewhere to live, that's some consideration to make sure that there were, you know, two bathrooms, so two toilets yeah. and a separate bathroom. That if I'm in mine, um, that then um, my partner can still have a shower and all that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, that's really important. And um, Lynn set up over here. You can see you've got some drawers there, Lynn, that um, are on wheels, a bit like what Peter mentioned as well. And also, you, you got a bench, uh, a wide bench there that you transfer up to. And the floor as well, I can um, see um, you've got a different floor. Yeah, yeah, that's that's one of the floors that Steve was talking about before, and, and I hate it in the moment that I can renovate some tiles <laughs> are, are going to go down. Uh, I wanted to mention a couple of things. I like the transfer bench because it gives me greater ability to go side to side to mm. particularly wash my bum. I find that um, yeah. on, a, on a seat or a commode, I find it really difficult to both wash and dry my bum. Um, Sal, I don't know if you could just put your pointer up a little bit to the bottom of the rail that's got the shower rows on it. No, to the left. Yep, a little bit higher up. That's it right there. That, that little black thing is a handle that attaches to the shower rows so that if someone else uses the shower and has the shower rows up high out of my reach, I'm able to grab that handle and pull the, the shower rows down. I've got uh, tape around the bottom of the transfer bench's legs because they are height adjustable and they fill up with water and rust and then all that rust mm. goes, goes onto your flooring. Um, and the last thing I think I want to show you is the um, towel rail that's between the toilet. Yep, the toilet. That's actually a, both a to towel rail and a grab rail. Um, and I had that put in because very occasionally my foot will slip out when I'm leaning forward and I'll need to grab something to get my, lift myself or lift my chest back up. But I like the ability to have a... Um, a tail hanging as well. Lynn, can I just point. ask with your, sorry. I was going to say, it's a really good point you bring up about the lino. Um, Lynn, I, um, my previous bathroom, I, tend, I found that I was replacing the lino every four or five years. It wasn't terrible and it would lift a little bit in the seams where it was um, welded together, but it may have also been the people that installed it. <laughs> Since I've tiled my bathroom in a new house, so uh, yeah, I found the tiles better than the liner. Yeah, yeah, it's a personal choice, isn't it? You know, I mean, if you people out there all tell that they've got like purpose-built bathrooms there, um, 
and of course they got to last a long time. But it's good for them because some of the people watching at the moment are for, at the World Cup. Um, but hopefully they'll be able to see that you know they can go with different styles or different types of modifications, whatever they think is going to be suited to them. You know, as long as they work with the AT in trying to plan it out, there's lots of options out there for them. And yeah, I want sorry. to add to that, Steve and I have um, worked together on some lovely bathrooms that have ended up looking really nice, but also meet the person's functional needs. Um, mm. So yeah, you can sort of customise these things. Um, sometimes it will cost you a little bit extra personally, particularly if you're working with a funding body, but you do have more choice and control probably now than you did some time ago. This yeah. bathroom here, Rachel, is not one I actually worked on, but I had privilege to see. It's just another great example of um, someone applying a little bit of their, their own design flair, taking tiles up to the full height of the ceiling, um, adding some snazzy, you know, natural timber sort of cabinetry in there to make it feel a bit warmer and a bit more homelike. Uh, also, a couple of nice comments that have come through. Um, Colin was mentioning, mentioning that Wall hung toilets with wall systems can be problematic for large wheel commodes. So I think uh, that's that's worth mentioning. And Collins also mentioned uh, toilet height needs to be selected as um, there's a height for wheelchairs to toilet transfers. So um, I, hopefully people are seeing those comments. Helen has mentioned we have a hospital grade flooring that has uh, been kept in good quality since 2010 with very with showering every day. So uh, a good product there, hospital grade flooring. And Colin is saying very important when talking with the designer and builder to get the heights right. Rachel and I would totally agree with Colin when you're talking about doing the selection of the toilet because he's right. And it's really important to determine whether the user of the bathroom is going to be likely transferring or whether they could be using a commode because they do and will result in different height toilets. Uh, I'll chime in here. Unfortunately, Anthony Bartle wasn't able to join us today and he sent us the next few photos. I'm also conscious of time. So, um, Naz, do you want to do Quick tips from everybody. Well, we are recording this session and the recording will be available to everybody. Um, but, uh, and we'll go over time today. If yeah. you stay, feel free to stay. If not, we'll send out a link to uh, the recording that you can catch up on the rest of the session. So just a question now, do we do a quick tips and tricks from the panel? We'll leave that till the end and motor through bedrooms and other things. So we can move, move straight to the tips and tricks or we can uh, quickly go through the slides. Yeah, just conscious that some people will have to leave us yeah. at 30. Yeah, okay. All right, so if we go to like a takeaway message uh, from people, um, in a nutshell, um, I'll go start from Ben again. Um, what, what have you learned, um, Ben, that, that you'd like uh, others to know? Well, it, it takes a while to get things right. I suppose that's that's one thing to know. The other thing to know is that, you know, designing for disability does not mean ugly design. You can yeah. have quite attractive, uh, disability-friendly, accessible houses, uh, which look really good. No, exactly. Georgina, have you got, like, a... Uh, a final tip to give to people out there? Yes, mainly just to take note of um, the rooms that you're going to be using more often than not and making sure that it's accessible for you in terms of fitting underneath benches or height-wise. So just take note of that. Thanks, Georgia. You, Lynn? I'm going to agree with Ben and let your personality shine. If, if you yeah, like, you right. know, if, if you like a good looking house, then that's fine. Go yeah. for it. Antonio? 
Oh, I would agree with Ben that it could take a while to get right. Um, you know, really pay attention to detail, but also, you know, don't copy what's out there as well. Personalize it to yourself, you know, really have it, you know, to make your life easier as well. Um, just because it's set up a certain way in rehab or you've seen something, even in a lot of the pictures seen today, um, if it doesn't work for you, then it's useless to you. Just really cater it to yourself. That's the most important thing. Yeah. And Steve, did you want to add? Uh... I can't do my work without OTs. So engage a good OT. Um, it's called a home modification, but think of it like a renovation and think of, do some research on the appliances and fixtures and fittings and colours and really just get an accessible environment that's a really home-like environment and that's the secret to a good outcome. And, and while you're on that, there's a question from Helen asking, for those who are not part of Royal Talbot, where do we find a qualified and experienced OT to assist with NDIS complex home modifications? Rachel, we'll throw that one to you. Yeah, great question, Helen. Um, I would go on to the OT Australia website and they have a find an OT tab. I would look, there's some like drop down boxes where you can customise what you're looking for. One of them being someone that's had experience with NDIS and the other one that does home modifications. And then I would personally ring up, narrow the list down, ring those people up and ask what's your experience been um, the types of uh, population that that OT has worked with and get a sense of how to pick someone from there. Thanks. Now I'll continue. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's all right. No, 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 great points. Uh, uh, so we heard from Rachel. Was there anything else, Rachel, that you wanted to let people know? Yeah, I just think that, um, especially from what Ben said, it does take time. And sometimes you might, if you're especially in the hospital, you might discharge at doing one type of thing, say, for example, using a commode. And then in the future, your level of function might change. Um, and, you know, you might be able to do some different types of transfers and things. So sometimes you need that time to go out, experience life in the community if you've had a new spinal cord injury and work out what works best for you. Yeah, great. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, Peter? Um, what I could say is the building process is actually quick. It's the planning process that takes a long time. And uh, really engage the planning process. It does take a long time but there's so many people that get involved for the benefit of the planning process and really explore that, be part of it, um, learn as much as you can, put you know, your effort into it and get that experience. And it's a joint, joint effort together and work through it to plan it well to be, and then move into the building part of it. Um, I did mine in stages because um, I wanted to get into my house. So, you know, there's many different options. Just see what works for you. Yeah, great. Thanks, Peter. And Josh? Yeah, definitely um, echoing uh, Rachel's points there. Uh, that was me. I, I left rehab with, you know, with the slide board and the commode. And then over time and uh, re doing rehab, I was able to now just do self-transfers for everything. And also to Peter's point, Nuz, um, it's a journey and it's planning. And um, don't be afraid to contact, uh, contact us here at uh, Spire AQA and... You've seen some of our mentors today and, you know, that's what we're here to do. Share our lived experience and uh, give you guys some uh, thinking points and uh, some talking points that you can take back to your OT and uh, the architect and all that sort of, uh, that sort of jazz. No, that's uh, ex exactly right. Really good points. Uh, all I was going to say um, to add to that, pretty much uh, agreeing with what everyone said, but home modifications, uh, you know, they're big, um, and costly work that needs to be done to people's homes. Um, don't go with the flow. Um, you know, if you've got um, a modification that you've been told you, you must do, um, well, consider that. But also, look to us guys, you know. I, I think uh, each one of us, if, if someone is going to remodel their bathroom or make some other modifications, they can come and chat to us and um, probably come and have a look and see our modifications in person once we're allowed with this COVID-19 stuff. But um, yeah, it's really important to see other stuff, other people's work and see what options you've got out there. Um, you, you, 
yeah, that's uh, what I've got to say. All right, thank you. Uh, now, everybody, you're welcome to stay with us if you can. Uh, we're going to continue to record the session and we'll make the full recording available via YouTube in the next few days. Uh, we've got a little bit more material to get through. So, uh, in, as they say on the radio, we're, we're losing the satellite link, but we'll continue to record and you can pick us up on the, uh, on the podcast or the vodcast. So, uh, panellists, please stay if you can. Uh, attendees, please stay if you can, and uh, we'll, we'll push on. Uh, we've got one question since we've got we're in uh, overtime now. Um, Colin from Tassie's got an unrelated question about: uh, Does anyone know of a scissor lift capable of lifting up about two hundred and fifty kilograms? <laughs> a scissor lift. We, and uh, what's a four? Did you check the eBay? Uh, uh, use. Uh, so he has a pop-top caravan that he can use car ramps to get access in and out of with the help uh, at the moment, but would like a height, a lightweight scissor lift type of system capable of lifting up to 150 grams. I think, Colin, if you're talking about getting in and out of your caravan, I'm going to just take this. Um, you probably want to look at what some of the car modifiers, and they have some... Um, uh, hoists that they can attach to the back of cars or sides of cars that maybe that might be where you would be looking for something like that if I've understood the question right. Would you agree, Rachel? Yeah, I think um, that sounds right. I don't have a specific um, example or, or option, but um, having a chat with some of the, the car dealerships is a good idea. Yeah, um, I might add a little bit to that. There's two ways with those lifters. There's, of course, the um, swing one that comes up and down that's hydraulic that sits inside the caravan or what you want to and then there's another type that's a cassette type that goes underneath the caravan and can come up and lift you up so I think about that of course the cassette type will be low much lower so you need to put it near the wheels so it doesn't collect anything yeah. um, and while we're, we're talking home mods but a caravan is can be a home uh, Lynn, you've got a, a modified caravan. Did you have any more that you would add? Don't forget you're muted. Unmuted now. Um, I've had a, a look at the cassettes and uh, the, the last that I heard was that um, because of their positioning, when a caravan was going, say, up the driveway, or the crossover that it can bottom out so that they were having some issues with it, but I'm not sure where they're up to that. And can I add in that I note that two of our attendees have their hands up. Oh, okay, good, good one. Uh, who've we got? So we've got Ross. I'm gonna click, uh, allow you to talk, Ross. So Ross, you're now unmuted if you would like to speak your question. Uh, Showing up muted for me. Maybe. Can you hear me? Oh, hang on. Sorry. There he is. Try again, mm -hmm. Ross. Unmute, unmute yourself. I accidentally muted you again. Hello? Yep, good. We can you hear you. Um, firstly, thank you, Steve, for your help four years ago. Great to see you, Ross. It's been amazing. I, I, I see that those tiles are being used in bathrooms. I'd encourage you to look at non-slip vinyl. Um, the one that uh, Steve recommended has been excellent. I'm aware that there are people probably at Talbot now in bed listening to this, perhaps with an iPad or on television. Um, a thing that was of great use to me was to have an iPad during my injury and be able to look at it whilst I was in the hospital bed. And I was able to Google, I was able to Google information about beds and uh, hoists and all the aids. I could do that prior to leaving Talbot so that with Steve's help, we were able to get the building process organized while I was still in Talbot. I was able to pay the builder with my iPad, with NetBank. Um, Steve produced some wonderful drawings, but 
as an architect, I would caution against giving any builder possibly this or possibly that. My experience with builders is this, and there's a lot of good ones, and there are some that you need to be careful of. You need to tell them precisely what it is that you want. Otherwise, there'll be arguments about substitutions. and So I just found that with the iPad, it simplified those eight months in Talbot to a point with, with Steve's help, it's just been exactly what I needed. We have a two-story house and I thought about having to move and then I thought I could put a lift in, which you've done. So the lift has given me independence and I can stay in the house that I have. That's probably enough, but um, I'm just aware that we're talking to unfortunate people like myself who are in Talbot at the moment. And uh, if, if you can all get hold of an iPad and get some assistance with it, um, that would be a really good thing. That's great. Thank you, Ross. And you. Um, having mentioned the, the lift, do stick around. We've got one of a doozy of a lift to, uh, to show you shortly. Um, I think I've heard about this one. Um, yeah, stick around. It's worth it. Uh, all right. So we've got a, another live question from Nick. Nick, I've just uh, allowed you to talk. So if you would like to uh, ask your question, uh, you, you may need to... I unmute you. Okay. Are you all right? Can, Go for it. Yeah, can, can, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, uh, good. Uh, well, yeah, I just wanted to say um, that uh, with my experience, house, house hunting, um, as I was uh, leaving uh, Royal Talbot in 2014, I had to spend... Uh, nearly a year and a half in support accommodation while I was uh, house hunting. Uh, I was able to sell my um, e existing house rather quickly, but finding a suitable house for modification took a long time. But what I found handy was that um, uh, houses available to buy uh, can be viewed online uh, with well-detailed and dimension spaces of uh, door width, passage and bathroom size uh, that would determine uh, them to be suitable for modification. And also in those drawings online, they also show uh, where they have steps inside the house and the size of the step. Uh, not always, but... Um, I found that uh, most houses advertised nowadays uh, do show those drawings and uh, one can save a lot of time in choosing the right home to go and inspect because it takes a lot of effort to get into a house for inspection. Somebody needs to get you in and um, if it's not suitable, you've wasted uh, a whole day. Uh, so having a look online is very helpful. Uh, that was my, uh, my point here. Fantastic. Thanks, Nicholas. That's uh, great advice. Uh, okay, shall we uh, push on with the... Colin, you had your hand up, but it's gone down again, so I'll assume that your question was answered. And we'll push on with the, uh, the show. Thanks, everyone who's staying on. Um, we'll get, get, you, get back on the slideshow now. So, um, <clears throat> as I said, uh, these next slides are from Anthony Bartle. Unfortunately, he couldn't join us today. This is his bedroom. Uh, he has what's called a H-track hoist, and you'll see the mechanism tucks over into the corner here. And uh, our next slide shows the mechanism itself with the, uh, the hoist and just a shot of it hovering over the bed. We've got a few more shots of Anthony's uh, bedroom. This is his bed set up. Now, Anthony is a um, very high quality, he's ventilator dependent. So he has fairly high needs, but he's got this fantastic system called the Vendlet sheet. So we're gonna just take you through a sequence of slides that show you how the Vendlet sheet works. You'll see these two bars on either side of the bed. 
the attendant will um, press a button and you'll see that one of the bars comes up. And as the bar comes up, it also rolls the sheet. And what happens is that this allows the uh, attendant to help turn Anthony onto his side in bed without having to manually handle him or lift him. So uh, a nice little uh, idea for those of uh, those people that have got very high needs. And um, if anyone wants to make a comment on that, but I just thought it was a terrific idea and um, grateful that Anthony shared that with us. Uh, okay, so we'll move on. So this is Lynn's bedroom. Uh, so what I wanted to show you here is a couple of things. Firstly, in the uh, the hanging space on the right hand side, I have two levels um, so that I can swap winter and summer shirts because the bottom level is really easily accessible. Um, I got some hooks on the, the wall which has got hats on it at the moment. The idea was for backpacks. Uh, right in the corner on the left hand side is a washing basket on wheels so I can push it down to the um, laundry. And again, easy access uh, to shoes. So between the, the bed and that side table, I too have, a, a, well I have two things. One, I have a stick uh, that I can grab and drag things and the other one is a, um, I don't know what do you call the picker upper of things. Um, that I can grab shoes or stuff that's fallen. Pick up stick. Great. And Nas, you want to tell us about this setup? Oh, everybody, this is my fantastic setup. Um, it's it's called Monkey Bars. So I went through like many many years ago, nearly nearly thirty years ago, I think, um, since my injury. But this is what they they gave quads and paras and uh, I know there's a lot of question marks behind it now and because of shoulder issues the physios and OTs don't really recommend this and they've got different options for people to use but I find it really helpful for myself and um, it, it pretty much uh, allows me to sit up and I put my hand or my wrist through the triangle there and lift onto my elbow, lift myself onto my elbow so I can sit up. And yeah, just to get dressed and all that sort of stuff. Uh, without it, I would struggle. Uh, I know there's other options out there. I, I recommend people look at all the options. Um, but I love it, you know. Can I see here Rachel's thoughts look. on this? Just you, think. Exactly what Nas said, um, not really great for all those muscles that hold your shoulder joint in together like that. Um, so it's something that I wouldn't personally recommend and probably the OTs and the physios here wouldn't either. But it's all about choice and control and what works for you best. So as long as you understand why your therapist might not recommend something, at the end of the day, it's your decision what you go with. Exactly right. Thanks, Rachel. I mean, I, I could argue with you around that point, but um, it, yeah, it, it's what what you think is going to work. You know, I mean, you don't do something and think it's okay. You know, you need to listen out to the professionals and, and understand why they say it's not um, um, useful uh, in, in the long term anyway. Rachel, so would an alternative to that be like a bed pole or something? Yeah, or maybe like um, some electronic bed functions might be an option as well, or maybe some side rails if it's about turning and positioning. Um, yeah, lots of different things to consider. Okay, and we've got uh, another comment from uh, Ross. Ross, uh, un uh, you can, if you can unmute yourself, be able to have the floor. Can you hear me? Yes, go for it, Ross. Yes. Um, I was... Uh, I was a tennis player and a keen tennis player and I played tennis in the gym there at Talbot, Royal Talbot and the Tennis Australia coach said serve, serve overarm like you used to and I put my shoulder out for about nine months with a frozen shoulder and I think I'd be saying to Naz when you get to 70 and plus I know you're a, an Olympic class athlete Naz 
But apparently when you get to 70 and over, as the, your physiotherapist would tell you, uh, your shoulder won't stand that sort of <laughs> strain on a monkey bar. No, that, uh, I understand that. Um, but, so you don't play tennis, you say? Yes. Um, Is that a monkey bar tennis racket? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll push on. We'll push on. Uh, no, no, I, Thanks. I, I, I see the point, um, and it's, it's something that I'm um, keeping an eye on. Yeah, very important on shoulders, as I'm learning to find out. Um, so next slide, Sal. Um, yeah, hang on. And we've also got a question from Helen about the website for the special bed with the sheet lift. Uh, the only thing I can tell you, Helen, is it's called Vendlet, but I will try and find out where it comes from. We'll send it out. Those of you that have participated in the in the webinar will um, be able to send you messages and I'll try and send something out for you there. Uh, okay, so I'm going to push on more bedroom space here. This is Ben's room. So um, a couple of things about this room. We bought, we bought a house which had been designed for people who uh, use wheelchairs. One of the features of that house was the um, door at a 45 degree angle. It makes it very easy to get in and out, but uh, more, and it gives you that extra room in the hallway where I'm sitting uh, to do a 360. Um, it also makes it very easy in the unfortunate event that the ambulance needs to grab you and uh, take you out the house. So. Um, on the left-hand side, you can see a J-shaped uh, hoist rail, so over the bed and along down the bed as well. And the the two beds are just kind of two companion beds uh, next to one another. Um, you can see the one I sleep in has got the alternating air mattress on it, um, and my wife sleeps next to it. Uh, they're identical beds. In case mine breaks down, I can move to my wife's bed um, and she can use mine um, in that sort of emergency. Ben, uh, is that loud, that air rating mattress? No. No, it's pretty good, actually. Pretty good. Interesting. Okay, we'll move on to the next slide. This was one that Steve sent in. Uh, I don't know if Steve's still with us or he's had to go and pick up the kids. But uh, I guess the, the feature of this was the recessed track in the ceiling and the hoist equipment can be stowed behind the cupboard here. Uh, so you've got a little, again, picking up that point that people were saying that it, you can still have a, a good looking house even if you do have some aids to assist you. All That's right. Good sell. I didn't even notice that. Yeah, you had to point it out. Yeah. 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 The door looks like it's automatic as well. Yes. It, yeah, it does look like it's got a, a a mechanism on it there. And a wide door as well. Great. We've got all the pickups here. Fantastic. <laughs> all right. Let's move on. So we're up to desks and workspaces here. And the light switches were at an accessible level too, so Sorry, I had to point that out. And they were quite big as well now, so easy to click. They were, they were quite large, so you can right, just... We won't go back. Let's, let's go on. Okay, Ben, tell us about your workspace. Yeah, so this is my rather messy desk. Uh, the only thing to point out is it has the uh, height adjustable mechanism. Uh, two buttons, uh, it's a safety feature, which thankfully my grandchildren haven't worked out yet. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. And these are... These are uh, some shots from Anthony. You'll see that he's got a manually operated uh, up-down desk with the crank there, but uh, he's got a number of features. So remember Anthony is the chap I mentioned earlier. He's got a cradle for his iPad here and uh, he can work on his iPad. And then in this shot on the right, you can see that he's got his phone. It's been Velcroed to a stand, the keyboard and the trackball are all Velcroed to the stand, so he can use those at the at, at the right height for him. So here sure. he's using the keyboard and using the trackball. And what that stand looks like uh, is 
this gadget here, it's height adjustable, it's got a heavy base, lots of Velcro, and then you add the Velcro to the backs of your tools and then you can stick them there. You'll also notice that Anthony's using a mouth stick. So he has, for the sake of these photos, he's taken away his chin control, uh, but he does have a mech, um, magnet on the side of his chin control where he can place the, the mouth stick. Uh, and there's also another shot, I think, later on where he's got a, a, a holder for the mouth stick. Uh, so we'll just push through. Uh, this is Anthony's reading table, just your standard over the bed table, little bit of a lip on it. And again, using the mouth stick, he can turn the pages on the, uh, the uh, material he wants to read. Uh, another version of the cradle for holding the tablet, which uh, can be attached to the side of his wheelchair. So just some natty ideas there. And then we move to uh, Peter Van Bentham's workspace. Yep, uh, some important things to me when I built my workspace was I wanted to be able to rock straight up to my computer and not have to put a keyboard out the way. So it's a narrow keyboard and a trackball mouse. Um, on the right, you can see how I can just drive straight up to the um, keyboard and it fits between my armrests. And then I type with a type stick to you, uh, typing stick to on my keyboard and stuff. Um, the left hand side of the desk has no leg in the way, so I can swing in and out. Um, I've built a bit of a recess behind my cabinets there down the bottom, so all the wires are tucked in down the bottom. It's actually a double station that my partner works from there, my son works from there, so lots of hidden wires don't get caught up with my feet. Another thing that was important to me was having lots of drawers on the right hand side. You can only see four of them there, but there's actually 10 and that's all filing that I can get to or I can see if somebody opens up and I know where all my filing systems are um, because I didn't want something up high that I wouldn't be able to use or see. Yeah. Pete, were you able to limit the amount of, um, I guess, keyboard and all that stuff using by using software on the computer as well? Yeah. Um, like Anthony has a lot of, um, like he uses a mouth stick still and what have you. Um, were you able to reduce all of that through software and create yes. more space for yourself? Yeah, I use um, programs that um, com that I combine with actually using the mouse and the keyboard, but big body articles that I don't have to type so much because I'm a slow typer. I can use voice recognition software and the voice recognition software has really um, stepped up a lot in the last 15 years, you know, nowadays it's really good uh, and you sort of you get a microphone set up or whatever that might be. Um, some people have a low voice, so you might need to put a microphone close to you on an arm or but they are very good these days in the way you can control a computer through voice software. You don't really need to touch a computer anymore, you can control it completely. Yeah. But was that able to, re sorry, was that able to reduce the amount of space you needed there just by having that software? Correct, yeah. yeah, and just the apparatus and all the bits and pieces. But there is a lot there, you can't see it. It's just that all the wires are hidden in behind that little cabinet there to avoid uh, where those doors are down low. Yeah. Thank you. All right, uh, we'll move on. I see on the uh, questions, the monkey bar debate continues, uh, but we'll, we'll let that one slide. We'll move into laundries. Couple of quick shots for the laundries. Georgina, you can take us through this one. Yes, um, you can see the dryer and the washer at, um, at a, an appropriate level. So you easily reach in to grab or put in your clothes. And below those are drawers that so you can put your dirty laundry in. And the middle cupboard there is just for all your washing products. Lovely, thank you. And Lynn, yours? I think you're muted, Lynn, if you're trying to speak. Very similar idea. So the height is based on if I stick my arm straight out, it'll go into the middle of the barrel. The doors both open outwards so that you can take things from the washer straight into the dry. You don't have to worry about the, the angle of the door. With the sink, um, the thing that annoyed me about laundry sinks is they're much deeper and therefore you can't uh, get in. 
So I've had the, the that whole stainless steel bit custom made so that the sink is quite deep, but it's angled on this side so that I can get butt right up to it. I've left the the um, shower or the water rose hanging down uh, simply to show that I can then pick that up and move it around. So my main concern was how do I wash clothes or sheets following um, a bowel accident? And this gives me uh, the, the room and the flexibility to be able to do it. Lovely, thank you. And um, we'll move on. Thanks, Billy. Uh, well into time on now. Um, other ideas and gadgets will zip through. So Ross, if you're still on uh, online, here's the uh, lift that uh, Nas built. Oh yes, this is this is my slide. So so pretty much, I was um, really unfortunate to go through before Steve and Rachel were around. Um, I've got a double story place, and um, I bought this is a an elevator, believe it or not, and it's built by the Fred Flintstone um, um, company. I made that up, by the way. Um, so it's a hand crank one. So the next slide there, so that, that's a platform which you roll onto. And um, that's the motor. The motor is a winder. So I've got to wind that to go up and down um, the two different levels. It's, How long does that take you, Nos? It takes me. By the time, if there was a fire, Antonio, in your house, <laughs> I'd, I'd be too late. I'm not going to go anywhere fast. Takes me about a minute to go up or down. And it's counterweighted. So, you know, it's actually not that hard to wind it, but it's like winding up a old car window up and down. Does a job. Um, and this was before uh, NDIS days, of course. Uh, but it does a job. Okay. Uh Nick's got his hand up again. We'll just get just a quick comment from you, Nick, if we haven't lost the moment. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to say that um, I, I have a front loader uh, washing machine which uh, works pretty well for me. And I also have a dryer uh, right on top of it, which I don't use. Instead to dry, I put my clothes on my parallel bars that um, I have for working out uh, and I'm able to dry within a day during the summer and within two days during the winter. Um, uh, I think it's a viable consideration. You save on power and maybe you exercise your arms a little more. Okay, thank you, Nick. And we've got uh, Colin, uh, I've just, allowed you to talk you just not need to unmute yourself and yeah um with regards to that lift that's still on yep we've lost you colin are you still there uh oh sorry that was my fault try again colin we okay i'm unmuted now yep sorry um with regards to that lift that's on screen that naz was talking about I had one of those in a workplace where I was working installed. Um, it would be back in 87. Um, they were a commercially available unit. But the thing is, inside that column are a bunch of lead weights that counterbalance to your weight. So it's only a one person lift and it's got to be balanced to their weight. So if someone got in there in a power chair, they, they would never move that lift. Um, I'm not even sure they'd fit in there with a power chair, to be honest. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's quite quite roomy in there. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, All right, we'll push on. Um, yeah, thanks for yeah. that, Colin. Um, and our next slide, so a little more from Anthony. Anthony is ventilator dependent, I think I've mentioned already. This is a drying rack he has for his hoses. It's a heated cabinet, uh, it's a great way of drying all the moisture out of his hoses. So he can hang the hoses from these rungs here and on this level also, and helps dry out the hoses, keep them uh, fresh and, uh, and healthy. The other thing that he uh, thought was a really useful tool for him is the floor to ceiling mirror. 
So uh, it just gives him a chance at the beginning of the day to see that he's been seated in his chair properly. He can check his chair, make sure there's nothing hanging off it and also check in that he's looking good for the day. And the other thing that he shared with us is this uh, gadget here for holding his tablet. It's another, uh, obviously the tablet plays a big part in Anthony's life. He can use the tablet in bed as well as uh, use the arm to extend to the side of the bed and uh, check his uh, uh, tablet on the side of the bed. And Lynn, uh, muted. <laughs> we'll get it right eventually. So on the left is uh, the ironing board that recesses into the um, uh, into the wall, just like Ben's cupboards. It's commercially available, and that all folds up and the door closes. I use um, the clothes rack there to uh, so I can push that from one end to the other because I found I was putting iron clothes on my lap, and by the time I got to the bedroom. <laughs> they'd picked up all of the dog hair or any dog hair or fluff in the house because they were dragging on the floor. So I found that worked right well. On the right, that's a platform as I come out of my back door and it's got a ramp going down to the left. I'm able to access all of the bins so that I don't have to, um, so I don't have to go up and down the ramp. I've got a worm farm to the right um, with it, it's got the tap leaning over that platform so I can empty it out. And then I've got some containers where I grow some um, fresh herbs. And uh, lastly, on the fence in the back of the photo is a height adjustable clothesline. Thanks, Lynn. And Peter, you mentioned your automated house earlier. Peter's had to go. Oh, Peter's gone. So this is just a screenshot of Peter's smartphone. Uh, these are the controls that he can use to open and close his front door, back door, roller doors to his garage. And it looks like there's some uh, controls for air conditioning in the house, lights and TV. So that, this is the, I don't know if we've got a Steve or a Rachel still with us. Um, no, both have had to go. But uh, this has been a big advancement for um, the, um, adding to the house. It's, 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 it's uh, available to anybody these days. I think I've seen them for sale at uh, Bunnings as well as uh, plenty of other venues. So this is obviously a, a great advancement in terms of making homes more accessible for people. Any other comments on that front? Uh, I've probably got very basic one uh sal is just i've got a remote control for my fan so i guess you know with some of our heat regulation issues if you want to leave the fan on during the night yep. um so you don't have to get up i can also just turn that off great yep so all those sort of cordless devices are really really handy for mm. uh comfort I, and access uh, i think that's a good point josh brings up as well like sorry sal um for anyone building a house whatever um especially quads with thermoregulation problems is, you know, heating and cooling in any house is probably going to be really important in all these spaces, especially bathrooms. Um, like the quads that get cold in the bathroom, um, that can cause some problems. So I think that's a really good point. Okay. Uh, we're into the last of our slides and um, I'll just whiz through these very quickly. Uh, this is a shot that Ben, you sent in from Sargood on Collaroy, is it? Yeah, this side goods uh, was bought in Colorado. I just included it as an example of uh, good design, basically. So you can see the ceiling hoist that's recessed, um, uh, the hoist in the itself goes in the cupboard. The rail is uh, quite attractive, and um, yeah, it just uh, it looks good and it shows that disability accessible, um, well, modifications to make a house accessible don't have to be ugly. Mm. Right. And if I could add, Sal, yeah. this place is just pretty much a club for spinal cord injury individuals. So if you're recently injured, this is a great place to go to uh, and expose yourself to travel. First, you know, travelling to Sydney and the place is just amazingly set up. 
You can do a heap of leisure activities, gym. And as Ben, ben mentioned, the, the facilities are um, five star for an individual with uh, a spinal cord injury. Okay, um, I noticed that Nick's got his hand up again. We're just gonna run through the last sort of slides and then I'll, I'll give you a chance to have a comment. So these are some slides that Steve sent us. This is just to take people through the process of planning and uh, getting to your new bathroom. So we start with the before shot, we return to the plan, remembering that Steve mentioned the looking at circulation space, width of doors, knee height, all those sorts of things, make, putting that all into the plan and then uh, taking people through the various stages of stripping the, the bathroom back, rebuilding, getting along almost there and then coming up with the final product. And again, I think great example of functional, but also has a nice aesthetic to it. Okay. Can I just add that I, I think that a lot of our bathrooms are wet rooms. So we, we can splash around a lot and uh, it doesn't matter. Yeah, and it looks like this room, this bathroom it actually has gone with the vinyl flooring, but it looks pretty good, I think. That's the end of the show, everybody. Just ran over, just. Just, just by 45 minutes. Thank yeah. you for those of you that have stuck with us. Uh, I see there's still 14 people around. Oh, awesome. uh, we've lost some of our panellists, we've lost some of our attendees, but it was a really full cool topic um, and great, uh, great to have everybody sharing their uh, tips and tricks and their photos. So thank you to all of you that have shared the photos. Thank you to you all that have participated in the question and answer in the chat. There's been some pretty good stuff going on today. Uh, Hans, do you want to say anything to sign off? Well, yeah, I just want to thank everyone as well. And anyone out there, if they've got any questions about any of this, please contact us and we'll uh, help uh, talk you through it. And even if you've got modifications that you think might be useful to share as well, let us know about it. Great. And I've just noticed a comment from uh, Brata. Home automation can be controlled by voice command to home, Google Home and Alexa or Siri. At the moment, I can use voice command to open, close garage door, turn off lights and PowerPoint. So, yes, the next wave of home automation yeah. upon us. That's awesome. Rada. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, panellists. Thank thanks, you, panelists. Thank you, ball boys. Thanks, Nils. We'll be back in... Yeah, thanks. Two weeks. Yes. Do we remember the topic? Sexual health and relationships. Thank yeah. you. Thanks again, everyone.